Hello students, and let us continue from the previous lecture where we looked at a, a two dimensional bar element. We had uh, developed uh, its uh, equilibrium equations. Then we have also seen how to apply the constraints on the system to prevent the rigid body deformations. And let us continue for higher order elements in uh, today's class. And before that, um, let us uh, do one more thing with the bar elements. Let us derive uh, the stiffness coefficients directly by applying um, uh, the unit uh, displacements in the global directions directly. As previously, we had uh, looked at the local coordinate system where we defined uh, uh, two displacements, one is axial and the other is shear. And um, let us look at another method for deriving the uh, the stiffness uh, coefficients. Let us take the same uh, two node um, bar element and uh, there are um, four displacements ux1, uy1, ux2, uy2. This is node 1 and that is node 2 and uh, let us say that there is an alpha here. And um, let us now apply the displacements directly in the global directions and then measure the forces developed in the respective directions. So, in that context, let us apply unit displacement at node 1 in the x direction that is u1 is 1 while all the other displacements are constrained. So, we are setting v1 to 0, v2 to 0, u2 to 0 okay. and if you apply a unit um, deformation in the x direction, the change in the length delta L is cosine alpha okay. and then the axial force developed is the stiffness multiplied by the change in the length k times delta L and that is k times cosine alpha and this k is Ae by L and that is the axial force developed and now we can um, resolve this, this axial force into x direction and y direction. So, the force in the x direction that is the force at node 1 in the x direction is by definition k11 because we applied a unit deformation in the degree of freedom 1 and then we are measuring the force in the same direction and uh, that k times cosine alpha result to x direction is k times cosine square alpha right. And then if you resolve this force in the vertical direction, it is uh, axial force multiplied by sin alpha and that will be k21 because the force developed in direction 2 because of a unit displacement in direction 1, right. So, p times sin alpha that is k times cosine alpha sin alpha and then uh, the forces developed at node 2 at degrees of freedom, freedom 3 and 4 should be equal and opposite. So, we say uh, that k31 that is the force developed in degree of freedom 3 because of a unit displacement in degree of freedom 1 is minus k11. Similarly, k41 is minus k21, right. And similarly, we can apply a unit displacement in the y direction at node 1 that is v1 is 1 while we constrain all other displacements u1 to 0, u2 and v2 to 0 and uh, this unit deformation will uh, change uh, the length of the element by sin alpha, right. So, the force developed, the axial force developed is k times sin alpha and uh, if we resolve the, uh, the force in the x direction is k12 because the force developed in direction 1 because of a unit displacement in 2 that is p sin alpha times cosine alpha. So, k times cosine alpha sin alpha is your uh, k, uh, k12 okay. and um, the vertical component this vertical direction uh, that is k22 is a p times sin alpha that is <coughs> k times sin square alpha. Then um, the coefficients at the other node 
will be negative because um, we need to maintain the equilibrium. They should be equal and opposite. So, K32 is minus K12 and K42 is minus K22, right? And similarly, we can um, apply unit uh, deformations in the other uh, degrees of freedom and measure the forces. And we see that all these coefficients k cosine square alpha, k sin square alpha, k cosine alpha, sin alpha and all these things they are exactly the same as what we had derived earlier. Okay? And uh, this is another way of um, uh, deriving these stiffness coefficients directly by using the definition. So, these bar elements we call them as a C naught type elements that they are formulated in terms of only the displacements at the nodal degrees of freedom and so they are called as a C naught. But next we are going to look at the beam elements which are flexu flexural elements that have an axial force, then um, shear force and then, uh, then uh, rotational uh, degree of freedom and uh, corresponding um, moment capacity also it has. And uh, so, this beam element is called as a C1 element because the nodal variables are both the displacements and then the rotation. The rotation is the first order uh, derivative of the displacements. Okay. So, it is, uh, so the beam element is called as C1 and uh, there are some higher order elements, the shell elements where the nodal, dis uh, nodal uh, degrees of freedom are displacements, first derivative of the displacements and then the second derivative of the displacement that is the curvature and these are called as C2 elements. But for geotechnical engineering, um, we will be mostly concerned with C0, all our uh, soils, soils are formulated in terms of only the displacements. And then um, uh, we do have beam elements uh, because we need to use them for sheet piles and other type of uh, support uh, structural elements. Okay. We will not come across C2 type elements. Okay. So now let us move on to higher order elements that is the flexural element and the beam element uh, with 6 degrees of freedom. Previously we had um, a bar element that has 4 degrees of freedom. And this beam element has um, 6 degrees of freedom and uh, let us initially consider only the element coordinate system that is our um, axial displacements and then the shear displacements are, are defined with respect to the direction of the element. So, we have um, at node 1 uh, 3 degrees of freedom, axial displacement u1, shear displacement v1 and then a rotation theta 1, then the corresponding axial force P1, shear force F1 and then a moment M1. Similarly, at node 2, we have U2, V2 and uh, theta 2 and the corresponding forces P2, F2 and M2, right? And uh, so, there are totally 6 degrees of freedom as shown here and uh, correspondingly 6 forces axial, shear and moments and uh, we assume that the axial and then the other forces the shear and moment are uh, decoupled that is if you apply any axial deformation you will generate only the axial forces and uh, there will not be any shear force and the moment and uh, similarly if you apply any shear deformation or uh, rotation will not produce any axial forces. That is an assumption and it is uh, true if your um, order of displacements are very, very small where you do not change the length by applying some shear deformation. Okay? And uh, the shear deformations will cause only the shear forces but also the moments because now we are dealing with uh, flexural um, elements and any uh, shear deformation will be associated with some rotation, then corresponding the moments are, so are developed. And similarly, if you apply any rotation, it will not only develop some moment, but also the shear force, right? Okay. And um, once again, we can uh, derive 
uh, the stiffness coefficients uh, by systematic ap application of the unit displacements in different directions. And initially, we are going to uh, define the stiffness uh, coefficients in the local direction and then uh, we will think of uh, converting this into some global uh, coordinate system. And uh, to help us in developing our uh, stiffness coefficients, we need to know some fundamental results and I hope all of you know that if you have a cantilever beam subjected to some uh, tip load and a tip moment, the resulting uh, deformations under the tip load are PLQ by 3EI and ML square by 2EI and the rotations are PL square by 2EI and theta is ML by EI and we can uh, use these equations to uh, derive our um, stiffness coefficients. Okay. So, the application of axial uh, deformations U1 and U2, and U2, they will produce only the axial forces and all the other um, um, coefficients related to axial force in the shear and um, rotational uh, forces, they are all 0. K11 and K44 are AE by L, K14 and K41 are minus AE by L. The same thing as uh, what we had seen with the uh, bar elements. Okay. And now, um, let us apply unit deformations and the shear and then the rotational um, degrees of freedom and see what happens. Okay. And uh, let us take a node 1 and apply a unit deformation V1 of 1, the shear deformation of 1 and that will uh, produce some force K22 that is the shear force developed at node 1 and then uh, the rotational force at the moment uh, developed at node 1 that is K32 because V1 is actually the second degree of freedom and similarly there will be two more forces uh, developed at the other end that is K52 that is the force developed in degree of freedom 5 because of unit displacement in degree of freedom 2 and K62 is the moment developed at node 2 okay. while we set uh, theta 1 to 0 and then um, uh, V2 and uh, theta 2 0 at the other end. Okay. So now, um, our shear displacement at node 1 could be because of shear force K22 or the moment K32 and V1 is 1 and uh, that we can equate uh, to the displacements uh, from both the shear force K22 and then the moment K32 like this K22 L cube by 3 i minus K32 L square by 2 e i because the flexural stiffness tries to resist uh, the, uh, the deformation. So, we have a minus here and then similarly our um, uh, we have one more equation theta 1 is 0 that is K22 L square by 2 E i minus K32 L by E i and um, that is equal to 0 and um, so we get a relation between K32 and uh, K22 like this and we have four unknowns or four coefficients to be determined K22, K32, K52, K62 and V1 of 1 and theta 1 of 0, we got uh, two equations and uh, we need the two more equations and uh, that we can get from our um, equilibrium equation, the net force is 0, net vertical force is 0 and net moment is 0 around any point. Okay. So, the sigma of vertical force is 0 means that K22 plus K52 is 0. So, K52 is minus of K22 and similarly, the moments about any point are 0 and uh, let us consider uh, the moment about um, this, uh, this point 2 that will be K32 plus K62 minus K22 times L where L is the length of the element that is equal to 0 
and uh, now we have four equations v1 is 0 theta 1 is 0 sigma of vertical forces is 0 and then the net moment is 0 okay and by solving uh, these four equations we get uh, these four coefficients k22 k32 k52 k62 right and um, actually you may know these terms 12 ei by l cube 6 ei by l square and then uh, we will also see 4 ei by l later on these are all the same coefficients that you come across in our um, um, moment distribution method and then the flexural uh, sorry the, the flexibility method and so on okay. and now let us apply a unit rotation at uh, node 1 while we constrain all the other degrees of freedom so our theta 1 is 1 and v1 is 0 v2 and theta 2 are 0 and theta 1 is the third degree of freedom so the moment developed at this node is k33 and the shear force developed at this node is k23 and the shear force developed at node 2 is k53 and then the rotation the moment is k63 and uh, so we can um, do a similar exercise okay. theta 1 is 1 at node 1 and uh, that is uh, because of your moment and then the tip force k33 l by ei minus k23 l square by 2 ei these are the equations that we had seen earlier for the cantilever beam okay. and v1 is 0 so that is uh, k33 l square by 2 e i minus k 2 3 l cube by 3 e i and uh, that will give us some relation between k 3 3 and uh, k 2 3 and uh, then we can find uh, the other coefficients by using two more equations the net vertical force is 0 so that is k 2 3 plus k 5 3 is 0 then the net moment about um, any point like either this point or that point is 0 so k33 plus k63 minus k23 times l okay. and by solving uh, these four equations we get these four coefficients i'm oh, sorry yeah k23 k33 uh, k53 and k63 and similarly uh, we can apply unit deformation and unit rotation at the other node at node 2 and then get the uh, these uh, coefficients okay. and, uh, and now we can solve or we can assemble all the equations and write equilibrium equations at the at the element level in terms of um, the forces p1 v1 m1 p2 v2 m2 and then the reaction forces right so that will be like this uh, the axial forces they are not affected by shear or um, shear deformation or the rotation and similarly if you apply any rotation you will not develop any any axial force okay so this is um, the set of equilibrium equations for the beam element in its own local coordinates okay and uh, let us uh, do a small problem let us take a uh, fixed end uh, cantilever beam with a tip load okay? and uh, uh, let us neglect axial deformation, axial forces and axial deformations u1 and u2 we are not considering, p1 and p2 also we are not considering. Okay? So the left side is uh, completely fixed and axial deformations are neglected, uh, the degrees of freedom corresponding to these fixed degrees of freedom can be eliminated. So this 1, 2, 3, 4 um, equations can be, um, can be deleted. Then we are only left with only two active degrees of freedom that is V2 and uh, theta 2 that is uh, degrees of freedom 5 and 6, right. So this is our uh, um, equilibrium equation that we have and we can solve this by inversion and um, so v2 is 
minus p l 2 by 3 e i and theta 2 is minus p l square by 2 e i. These are our familiar um, equations that we already know and uh, we just got back the same thing whatever uh, we already know by applying um, uh, the equilibrium equations that we had derived. So now let us extend um, this problem a little bit okay? and let us assume that now we have supported um, uh, the node 2 and a spring. Maybe that uh, could correspond to the support that we get from the soil uh, from some other member and now uh, we want to solve this problem. So it is actually it is a statical indeterminate problem right because we do not know what is the uh, the compression and if you know the compression you can find the force right it is actually it is a interaction problem it is not a, a straightforward that you can solve but um, say if your uh, spring is uh, rigid that it, it will not deform then uh, we can um, uh, then um, we can use that as an additional equation and um, and then uh, find the solution that we have. Okay. It is basically it is a statical indeterminate problem, it is a typical uh, uh, soil structure interaction problem okay. and the structure is consisting of three nodes, node 1, node 2 and node 3 and it consists of one beam element between node 1 and node 2, then one spring element node 3 and uh, node 2. And our spring element is like our uh, uh, uniaxial bar element, right? And the beam element uh, is connected between node 1 and node 2, and uh, the spring element between nodes 2 and 3. And we have the corresponding uh, degrees of freedom at node 1, u1, v1, theta1, at node 2, u2, v2, theta2, node 3, u3, and v3. Out of these, node 1 is fixed. So, u1, v1, theta1 are 0, then we are neglecting the axial deformation, so u2 is 0, then node 3 is fixed, u3 and v3 are 0, right. So, let us say that our um, uh, spring stiffness is Ks, okay. And um, since we are working with uh, local coordinate system, <coughs> we can directly write the equations for the beam element, then uh, the spring is in the direction of the shear force at node 2. So, we can directly add uh, the contribution of the of the spring uh, to the uh, to the uh, shear force component at node 2, right. So, we can directly add uh, this Ks to V2 or F2, okay. And, um, and then uh, we have F3 is um, Ks and then the interaction terms are minus Ks and minus Ks, okay. So, actually basically uh, this is our um, um, equilibrium equation or uh, the stiffness coefficient that we derived earlier for the beam element. Then we have added the contribution from the spring, right. And uh, this is the combined equilibrium equation for the entire structure consisting of a beam and then a spring. Okay? And in this the degrees of freedom 1, 2, 3, 4 and then um, and then um, uh, 5, 6 sorry the 7 and the 8 are uh, fixed. So, these rows and columns can be deleted and uh, we are left with only 2 degrees of freedom V2 and theta 2. Okay, this is our uh, uh, stiffness matrix and uh, by inverting it we can get our V2 and theta 2 like this. So basically it is um, it's the same equation that we had earlier except our Ks is there okay? and in the denominator we have um, some other um, uh, this function okay? where Ks is your um, spring stiffness. And because of the spring stiffness, we can expect um, um, smaller deflection at the tip and then a smaller rotation 
and then um, the, even the shear force in the beam section will be smaller and then the end moment also will be smaller okay. And the force developed in the spring is uh, V2 times Ks and then the shear force in the beam previously it was uh, just simply minus P because there is only some tip load but now because we have some reaction force in the spring that is Fs. So, the shear force is uh, minus P plus Fs okay, which is uh, obviously lesser than uh, the shear force in the cantilever beam right. Uh, Let us give some numerical values to appreciate uh, the effect of spring stiffness. Then uh, bending moment correspondingly bending moment in the, in the beam section also will reduce. So, let us look at a, a numerical example. Let us take a beam of length 10 meters and uh, let the, uh, the loading at the tip be 100 and the Young's modulus and then uh, I, the section uh, uh, moment of inertia of the section and then the cross sectional area. I have just arbitrarily given some values okay? and uh, the deflection of the cantilever beam is just simply PLQ by 3i. So, if you substitute all the numbers, you will get 0 0.00158 okay? and in some units okay? and uh, the same units as um, your material properties. Okay? And uh, now, let us add a boundary spring having a stiffness of 10,000 kilo Newton per meter, right? Some number that um, that I have just given and uh, now let us see what is the effect of this boundary spring okay? and our uh, delta uh, we have derived this equation earlier. Um, so, if you substitute all the numbers you will get 0 0.00136. Previously our um, deflection was 0 0.00158 and because of the spring stiffness it has slightly reduced. 0.00136 and then the spring force is a 10,000 times 0 0.00136 that is 13.6 and then the net shear force is 86.4. Actually, I am not looking at the sign convention, I have just um, I have calculated only the numerical value. See previously our shear force and the beam section was 100 that is corresponding to the tip load. But now, because of this uh, reaction force from the spring, it is only 86.4 and then the end moment is going to be 86.4 times 10 that is 864 and uh, in the cantilever beam with the tip load, uh, the end moment was 1000. So, there is a significant reduction in the, in the moment okay. and now, you might ask uh, what is the effect of this boundary spring, whether um, uh, the spring stiffness and then the spring force they are directly proportional to each other. They may not be because it is actually it is an interaction between the soil and then the structure, right. So, the uh, we cannot um, separately look at the contribution of either the spring or or the or the beam. Okay. Now we are um, combining both of these, and uh, let's illustrate this by taking some other boundary spring uh, stiffness. Okay. Let's take uh, now a stiffness of one thousand. Okay. Previously it was ten thousand. Now it is only one thousand, and our uh, tip displacement is 0 0.00156, very close to one five eight, and then the spring force is one point five six. So, it is not proportional. So, you see uh, when our um, spring stiffness was 10,000, uh, the spring force was 13.6 and I reduced the, uh, the boundary spring stiffness by 10 times and if there is a proportionality, uh, the spring force should have been 1.36, but now we get a spring force of 1.56. Actually, that depends on also the, the structure. Like let us say, your um, Young's modulus of the beam is very low, 
then the spring has to has to um, take a higher larger part then obviously the the compression in the spring will be more and then your uh, corresponding force will be more okay will be higher and that's why we call this type of problems as soil structure interaction problems because uh, the response depends not only on the soil but also on the structure okay so this is just a small illustration of our um, beam and then the spring element uh, that we derived earlier okay and uh, we also see that by considering um, and the support from the soil our forces that are developed in the in the beam section are reduced not only the shear but also the uh, the bending moment okay and um, so now let's look at um, uh, the beam element um, equilibrium equations in uh, global coordinates so we can use the same um, transformation matrix lambda transpose k lambda that we had derived earlier for the for the bar element okay because uh, there we had uh, two displacements u1 v1 at each node now we have one rotational degree of freedom theta1 and this theta1 is actually in the xy coordinate in the in the plane of the xy xy plane so even if you rotate to x prime y prime this theta will remain the same because uh, it is about a point about an axis that is uh, perpendicular uh, to this plane plane of analysis so our uh, transformation matrix will have only one uh, for uh, for the theta okay. so the lambda for this beam element will be a 6 by 6 matrix the uh, the transformation matrix or the of the direction cosine matrix um, it has uh, cosine alpha sin alpha terms then for the rotation we have unit value 1 so by going through this uh, orthogonal transformation we can get the stiffness matrix of the beam element in the global coordinates so what are the um or way what are the applications for the spring element and then the bar elements that we have developed so in the spring elements uh, typically we can use them in the soil structure interaction analysis as winkler springs and then um, node to node element for the free length portion of the of the tie rod in uh, soil nail walls or the pre stressed uh, grouted anchors and then tie rods and anchored sheet piles then strut supports in deep excavations or uh, the fixed end anchors of the sheet pile walls or we can use these uh, bar elements as geosynthetic uh, reinforcement layers or members in the in a truss structure that we had seen the example earlier in uh, in the lecture 4 okay so these are uh, some of the applications for bar and uh, spring element spring element is actually it's a it's a one dimensional element whereas bar um is a is a two dimensional element okay both are essentially the same both have uh, both can support only the axial forces and what are the uh, the applications for the beam elements so when we are dealing with any combined footing in foundation engineering we can represent the combined footing um, using a beam element right then we can um, represent the sheet pile walls with the beam element or the facing elements in retaining walls is actually any element that has some flexural stiffness can be represented by the beam elements okay beams and columns in a framed building and the diaphragm walls in our deep excavations okay and um, um so these um, we will see a lot of applications for uh, spring elements bar elements and the, the beam elements when we go for uh, analysis of any soil structure like um, say any retaining wall that is supported by some anchors or some props um and um, that type of structures um, require apart from um, the modeling of the soil we require um, 
uh, some extra elements for uh, sheet pile walls or for uh, tie rods and so on. Okay. We'll see some examples later on. Okay. Now let's uh, uh, do one thing uh, slightly different. So previously, um, I had referred to the soil structure interaction, and the one property that we require um, for uh, the soil structure interaction analysis is the Winkler spring, Winkler spring modulus, and uh, that spring modulus can be obtained from our uh, plate load test. Plate load test is a very common test that we perform in um, geotechnical engineering. So here uh, we have a photograph, here is a plate and uh, some pressure is applied, then we measure the deformation and we plot a graph between the pressure and then the settlement of the plate and we get a graph like this and then uh, the initial slope is taken as the, as the coefficient of subgrade reaction of the soil and this Ks is the slope that is the delta q by delta uh, the pressure divided by the by the deformation and the units for the ks that is the coefficient of subgrade reaction or um, the force per l cube units that is kilonewton per uh, cubic meter units okay. and uh, uh, this is a simple test that we perform for um, for getting our coefficient of subgrade reaction and um, so if we do not perform this test there are other methods for uh, getting it uh, from our allowable bearing pressure and then the allowable settlement also we can estimate uh, this coefficient of uh, subgrade reaction and um, let us do a small problem let us take a combined footing of 8 meters length and uh, then there are uh, 3 column loads, column 1, column 2, column 3, 300, 600 and uh, 300 kilonewtons and uh, then it is uh, the combined footing is of thickness 300 millimeters and then the width in the outer plane direction is 1 meter and uh, let us say that the footing is made of M40 grade concrete and uh, we are asked to estimate the maximum bending moment in the beam section both by the rigid analysis and soil structure interaction. Um, by rigid analysis what I mean is the analysis not considering the soil or in other words you consider the footing as an extremely rigid object that whatever may be the soil that you have uh, the soil becomes uh, flexible. Okay? So, the unit pressure at the foundation level is the total load divided by divided by the uh, by the plan area okay. and I uh, have not considered the self weight of the of the footing because it gets compensated when we calculate our uh, shear force at bending moment. Okay. So, for soil structure interaction analysis we do not consider any any self weight only when it comes to the settlements we require um, uh, the self weight. Okay. So, let us um, calculate uh, the bending moment in the section without considering the soil structure interaction. So, the bearing pressure on the soil is 150 kPa and then the maximum bending moment at the mid length is 150 times 4 times 4 by 2 times 1, 1 is the unit um, uh, width in the perpendicular um, direction that is minus 300 times 3 that comes to 300 uh, kilonewton meter per meter. Per meter means um, in the perpendicular direction we are considering a unit length and then the bending moment below the two extreme column, two outer columns is 75 kilonewton meter and um, the Young's modulus is approximately 5000 times square root of Fck and our uh, that is the compressive strength of the concrete that is um, that is uh, 40. So, that is 31622.78 MPa right and uh, 
the moment of inertia for this section is 1 12th bd cube that is a 2.25 times 10 to the power of minus 3 meters to the power 4 right and the cross sectional area is a 0.3 meter square okay and uh, we can perform a typical uh, soil structure interaction analysis by considering the combined footing as a beam elements and in this particular case I have divided this beam element into 16 elements by considering each beam element of length 0.5. So, we have totally 17 nodes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 nodes then there are 17 nodes corresponding to the to the soil or the below the spring and um, these are all the winkler springs um, having uh, some stiffness that we will see and then the column loads 300 600 and 300 okay and uh, let's assume that our uh, coefficient of subgrade reaction ks is 35000 kel kilonewton per cubic meter and uh, this is obtained as I mentioned from the plate load test, right. But then um, our uh, spring stiffness is in the units of kilonewton per meter units, not in this kilonewton per cubic meter units, okay. And so we need to convert uh, this uh, modulus into some stiffness that is in units of kilonewton per meter, and uh, there are uh, 17 nodes. 16 beam elements each of 0.5 meters length and then the beam is supported on Winkler springs provided at every 0.5 meters. Actually you might ask why only 0.5 meters because in the theoretical solution uh, the Winkler um, um, springs are provided continuously. So when we consider the integral equation we have a continuous uh, support. But because we are dealing with finite element analysis, we put these only at some discrete points and uh, the solution that we get may be only approximate, it may not be exact and uh, by considering more number of uh, Winkler springs, we may be able to approach uh, the theoretical solution okay? and um, how we convert this coefficient of subgrade reaction to the spring stiffness is very simple. You take this value 35,000 multiplied by area, the area of the footing that is controlled by each of these springs. So, if you look at uh, the two end springs, the, we can assume that they support the footing up to mid length, up to half the length of this first beam element that is uh, the length of the beam element is 0.5 and half the length is 0.25 and in the outer plane direction we have a width of 1. So, that is uh, so the spring stiffness for the two end springs is 35,000 times 0 0.5 by 2 times 1 that is 8,750 and the spring stiffness for the intermediate uh, springs are for all the interior uh, ones are 35,000 multiplied by 1 in the outer plane direction multiplied by 0.25 to the left and 0.25 to the right that is 17,500 okay. and um, then in the soil structure interaction analysis we have one parameter that is the fourth root of KSB by 4EI that is the lambda that is a soil structure interaction parameter and if your lambda L where L is the length of the footing, if lambda L is uh, greater than pi, we consider the footing as uh, flexible and if you perform any uh, soil structure interaction analysis, so you will see some reduction in the bending moment and if your uh, lambda L is less than pi by 4, we can consider that as rigid and uh, there will be only marginal reduction. I should have said marginal reduction but it uh, is okay, no reduction because if uh, lambda L is very very small okay. and uh, for this particular um, problem that we have my lambda is 0 
0.59 times 8 lambda l is 4.74 which is greater than pi. So, we can expect significant reduction in the bending moment okay? and uh, that is what uh, actually this is the result um, um, that um, that you can get by using a finite element program and this particular one is from my own program. I will be giving uh, uh, this program uh, for you, you can um, and along with uh, instructions on how to use the program okay? and um, it is a very simple program and uh, the axial forces are neglected. So, all the axial forces are 0, there are totally 16 beam elements, then the shear force and then the bend bending moment. You see that uh, the bending moment at the two ends is 0, 10th power of minus 11 that is practically 0, but then the shear force is not 0. So, actually the technically the shear force should be 0 at the two ends, but uh, because of the of the spring elements that we have uh, the shear force uh, need not be equal to 0 and the maximum bending moment that uh, that we get in the beam section is 190. See if you neglect uh, the soil structure interaction analysis it is 300 and if you consider the soil structure interaction there is a significant reduction almost a 30 percent reduction. Then at the at the at the two outer columns the bending moment is 59 whereas with rigid analysis you get 75 okay. And now uh, let us consider a slightly deeper beam. Um, of instead of 300 millimeters, I am considering um, half a meter thick beam and uh, lambda L is uh, 3.23. So, we should uh, still get some reduction because it is uh, it is uh, greater than greater than pi, but not as much as what we had in the previous case. So, now we get 237 uh, slightly more than what we had earlier and then 60 4.5 previously we had uh, 59 and 190 now we have 64.5 and 237 okay and uh, let's consider very very soft soil ks is a uh, 2 kilonewton per cubic meter and uh, let's um, say the beam depth is 300 millimeters so your lambda l is 0 0.41 which is very less than pi by 4 so, in this case uh, the results should be very close to the rigid, uh, rigid case. So, we see our uh, maximum bending moment is 299.9, then at the, below the two columns, outer columns it is 74.98 that is very close to 75, right. And uh, so, here I have some results from uh, different parametric studies and for this problem. Uh, the theoretical solution with the KS of 35,000 and uh, depth of 0.3 meters, maximum bending moment is uh, 194 kilonewton meter, then the maximum settlement is 5.5 millimeters and uh, through finite element analysis with this mesh uh, discretization we get 190.7 and uh, so if I take a stronger soil. Uh, with a subgrade reaction of 50,000, your bending moment is uh, lower and then the maximum settlement is also smaller. And if I take um, a deeper beam with the same uh, subgrade stiffness, we get um, some increase in the bending moment and then some uh, uh, reduction in the settlement. Okay. Then I am taking a 1 meter thick beam just to see what happens and your uh, subgrade reaction is uh, 35,000, lambda L is pi by 2, it is 1.92 and uh, so the effect of soil structure interaction may not be significant, it is um, so you see it is 286.8 and the settlement is 4.4. Then um, if we take very, very low subgrade reaction uh, just to make the beam as, as, rigid, as rigid as possible, your lambda L is 0 0.41 and your uh, maximum bending moment is 300, very close to 300, 299.9 okay. And uh, so actually if you take a, 
finer mesh. See, in this case, I have taken um, um, 16 beam elements, and um, if you perform with 32 number of beam elements, bending moment is slightly increased, like 191.8. So, next uh, you increase it to 64 elements, you may be moving uh, closer to this theoretical result. Okay? And the settlement is also. Um, uh, moving uh, closer to this. Okay. So, this is how we can um, um, use our beam element and then uh, the spring element and then the bar element for practical applications and we will see the applications, uh, more applications in uh, later classes. Okay. So, I think uh, that is the end of um, uh, this lecture. So, in this just to summarize, we have seen how to derive uh, the stiffness coefficients of uh, two dimensional bar element by applying um, uh, displacements in the global directions and then we have seen the uh, the stiffness matrix de development for a beam element. Initially we had considered only the element coordinates and then uh, we had um, seen how to develop uh, the stiffness matrix of the beam element in global coordinates by lambda transpose ke times lambda. Then we had uh, seen some examples of uh, the soil structure interaction by using our beam element and then the then the, uh, the spring stiffness for uh, Winkler springs. Okay. So, I will give you a computer program that you can utilize for doing this analysis and uh, you can uh, explore yourself what will happen if you take a I say very coarse mesh with um, not considering um, say 16 beam elements, but only consider only say 6 or 8 beam elements what happens or with a very large number of beam elements what happens. So, all these things you can, uh, can explore later. Okay. So, if you have any questions, please do contact me at this email address profkrg at gmail.com. So, okay, thank you very much. We will meet next time. Okay.